Okay. Um, I want to start with a simple question. Who of you in this room is working on JavaScript frameworks as developers? Awesome. So, <laughs> this is a talk um, I did um, to, to show some of the uh, design um, decisions we made. And I think this is something pretty interesting for any, uh, anyone writing JavaScript frameworks, but should be interesting for, for anybody else. So, what kind of frameworks am I talking about? So, my background is what, what we are doing. I'm working for, for Cookstu, um, and it is a rich GUI uh, JavaScript uh, framework, and we're doing uh, uh, single-page uh, page applications. So what you're seeing here is uh, GMXCOM uh, mail client, uh, which is written totally in Cooksoup. And we have um, widgets like the toolbars, the tabs, the, um, the menus, like the search bar of the tree. And what I'm talking, talking about today is how we actually implement these widgets. So widgets is not in the sense of a, uh, these mobile widgets, um, w, W3C uh, widgets, it's in the sense of uh, UI components. So what we're basically doing is we're treating the browser as rendering engine. So native applications like Java applications, Windows applications, use native APIs, we use the browser as rendering engine. And what we have in the browser, so I was glad uh, Dion put up this, uh, this slide in, the, in his keynote yesterday. It's basically we have three primitives. We have uh, images um, as um, single entities or as background uh, images. We have text with some ways to, to, um, to define the font and uh, uh, colors and things like this. And we have rectangles. Things like, this is the only primitives we have uh, if we want to support all browsers. Of course, we can use Canvas, but then it's hard to, this is not available in IE, so this is what we need to stick to. Well, and then these primitives, arranged in a tree. So we have a scene graph of all those, of all those elements, um, which is the DOM tree. And the DOM tree is pretty nice. It um, provides us uh, stuff like events bubbling through the tree and propagating through the tree. And we know exactly, for example, for click events, on which element the click uh, occurred, unlike if you have uh, the canvas where you have just the opaque rectangle and you, it's hard to match what is actually uh, the element behind the pixel you are clicking on. And then we have CSS for styling and of course JavaScript. So JavaScript is pretty much um, the thing which ties it all together. So let me present you the body. This is the widget. I'm trying to open right now. Spinner, cool. <laughs> well, it's pretty simple. Um, the the um, code you see there is um, Cooksu demo code. It's actually working code. And uh, the spinner is nice because it's not too complex. Still, it's something you compose out of other more, more basic widgets. It's simply used as, um, as an input for, for text. And this is the widget I want to talk about today. So the first step is, I said, the spinner is a composed widget. Um, let's take a look how the spinner is composed out of other widgets. OK. Our goal is to create widgets by composition. We want to create complex widgets by composing uh, simple widgets. And uh, like the spinner, basically is composed of three, four widgets, one container, um, one input field, and two buttons for the up and the down. 
What we want to do is use known GUI concepts to do this. Like we want to use layout managers to say how the widgets should be arranged. Or we want to use a rich set of basic widgets to compose it from. And of course we want to have uh, basic things like events. And the other thing is, at this level, I really don't want to hustle with the browser. I don't want to know which browser I'm in or uh, use any low-level browser APIs. Because this is code that, that I write on a much more abstract level. Let's take a little look at the source code. Um, in Kuxu, so this is Kuxu source code, a little bit like the juice a talk we, we, we've seen yesterday, our object model. So in Kuxu, widgets inherit from a widget, so we define a spinner widget, inherit from widget, and then we provide a constructor, and all we do is call the base call, uh, call the constructor of the base class. So this basically does nothing. <laughs> it's just a widget. So the next step is we want to lay out up, uh, the, the sub-widgets. And for the spinner, it's basically it's a grid. And uh, the input field should have a row span of two. And, and the, the spacing or the resize behavior should be that if I uh, resize it horizontally, only the text field should resize. If I resize it vertically, um, both rows sh should resize equally. And that what I, is what I'm saying there. I create a layout which, uh, no, layouts are not widgets. I create a layout manager, it's a grid, and, I, and then I say the row flags, that is the resizing behavior of the first and second row, uh, equals one, so it's resizable, and the first column, wow, it's a typo there, sorry. <laughs> so it should be, uh, uh, the column should be zero, because the first, First column, it's starting with, with a zero, so the first column should be should be flexible. Well, and then I want to add the widgets. So I want to add the text field widgets, and I pass in the value a string, and then I simply want to add this um, text field widgets to the parent, which is the spinner. And then I configure some some layout properties like the row where it should be placed, the column, and the row span. And the same is true for, for, for the buttons as well. Uh, additionally, I define the, the images for the up and down arrow. So this actually is working code. And this is something that what we had in mind. So we want to write widgets on a very high level, just like in Swing or Qt or any other widget toolkit. And let me switch to Firefox just to show it a little bit. So what I, what I have here is um, the Kuxu demo browser. No, the Kuxu playground. And I can type in code on the left and run it on the right. And what you see here, this was the first step. Just inherent from, from widget. And then I set a background color because otherwise you can't see anything. Then we have the next step. Let's pretty interesting. I add a layout and suddenly the widget disappears. That's why the layout manager uses the sizes of the child widgets and since I don't have any child widgets, it just, the size collapse. <laughs> Still. And then I add the, um, the text field. Again with the row, column and, and the row span. I can add the, the first button and the second button and voila, this is pretty much looking like a spinner. It's not nice, Should, some tweaking is, um, is needed, but this is pretty much the API we had in mind, how we want to, to create complex um, composed widgets. Okay, let's get back. So, now that we have the composition of, of widgets, the question is, if we have basic widgets like a label or an image which are not composed. How does it map to the DOM? What is the DOM generated or needed for this widget? 
So let's take this text field. Um, and this is approximately the HTML generated by, by the framework uh, for this widget. Um, basically we have uh, three, two to three diff elements and I will go to this, uh, to this in a moment. So first we have the container. In our case, the container is the DOM element added to the parent widget. Um, we use absolute positioning and we use fixed sizes. Um, why we do this? A little bit later. Um, then you have a decorator element. This is, I think this is a pretty interesting concept. Uh, the decorator element um, basically is a container for any background decoration. So I can add an image to this, I can add a complex HTML to render the background of the, of the uh, widget, and we have um, custom classes which are simply there to, to render the background of the widget. And then we have the actual content. Um, the content, the decorator, are at the same level of the um, um, DOM hierarchy, just a different uh, Z index, and the content overlays the decorator. And uh, I can change the decorator on the fly without changing anything else of, uh, on the widget. So it doesn't um, influence the layouting or uh, stuff like this. And the content actually is the element we want to display. In this case, it's the input element. Um, there are the little dots. Uh, we, we do set some styles to uh, reset um, the input element, so the input element itself doesn't have any Chrome. So, small summary of the, of the DOM structure. We do have two to three DOM elements. Uh, it's two to three because the decorator is optional. If I don't want to render any, uh, any background, there's no need for me to have this element. We use absolute positioning and fixed sizes. That's easy because if we do f fixed sizes, absolute positioning, that's the easiest stuff browsers can do. So there is no cross-browser issues in these two features. So cross-browser issues are just gone. And then we have something like no explicit padding and no borders. Does anybody have an idea why this is an advantage? No borders, no paddings? Okay. The advantage is that this is box model independent. Um, this works in quirks mode and in standards mode exactly the same way. Because in standards mode, if you specify the size, um, it will add to the size the padding and the border. And you will get something different to, to quirks mode where the size is just the size. And if we remove in our, our setup borders and paddings from the widgets, we gain um, box model independence out of the box. So I can, can show you how this maps to the DOM. doesn't look nice. Okay, so you can see here, this is the container element, it's a div, um, it has absolute po uh, positions, then this is the input element, this looks weird but most of these styles are generated by, uh, by the browser. So we, we use some of these, uh, these styles to, to make sure that the input element itself is basically invisible, so it doesn't have this border and the inset and background color and stuff like this. And then we have, this one is the decorator. And this decorator is actually a, lit, a little bit more complex because it's rendering these um, slightly rounded borders and it's using, it's using um, div elements to, to do this and leaving the edge pixels empty, and then it has a scaled uh, background image. And that's something we can do without interfering with any of the, the rest of the widget.
Okay, what are the pros, what are the cons of these, um, these decisions? First of all, we have box model independence. We have very flex flexible styling um, because we can uh, do almost anything. We could even do a canvas element there and draw something weird in the background. And we don't have any cross-browser issues because it's <coughs> stupid simple. The negative side is that we do have to use more DOM elements than with the basic, basic approach where the element is the widget, like the input element is the text field widget. And we do size computation in JavaScript because we have these fixed sizes. Um, we do have to do some layouting. And this is, of course, slower than the built-in um, layout engine. Okay, next, a little bit on theming. So this is only a teaser. <laughs> I like this image. <laughs> okay, we put the skin over the skull. So, just a teaser. Um, this is a very little um, calculator ap application I've written some time ago. And these two applications are exactly the same. The application source code is exactly the same. The only difference is that I use different decorator renderers. So all I do is um, I swap, swap the, the decorators used to render all these widgets. So none of the um, UI composition code also is affected to do this. Okay, let's get to the guts. Now, somehow we have to work with the DOM. So there's no no way around working with a DOM when we want to build a browser, um, GUI toolkit. So, how, how does this text uh, widget map to this HTML? So, what code is required to do this? First of all, this is, I think this should be familiar to all of you. <laughs> so, working with a DOM without any library is not fun at all. Like, we have cross-browser issues. Simple things like setting opacity of an element is very different in IE um, than in all other browsers. And there's many little things. So there are many cross-browser issues. Small mistake can degrade performance enormously. Like in this little snippet of code, um, I create an element, append the element to the body, and then I do it change the style of the element. And this is slow because every change to the style will update the layout of the, will trigger the layout engine of the browser. So don't do this. The simple change is to first create the element, set all the styles, and then append it to the document. Uh, this way, the layout engine is triggered only once. And this can make a huge difference. Just putting the line a little bit further down. And then simple things like reading styles and attributes from the DOM, uh, depending on the browser, can be very expensive. So reading from the DOM is expensive. So what we do is we try to wrap the DOM. So we, cre um, we create DOM wrappers for the elements we use for the widgets. Um, we do lazy DOM element creation because creating elements is so expensive. And we batch DOM operations. Additionally, we, st uh, we cache uh, style and attributes. So in the, in the code, you see here, let's, let's focus on this one. This is how um, the widget, so the very simplified widget could create its elements. Uh, and what you see is that uh, we create a QXHTML element instance, and this is the wrapper. And at this point, no DOM element is created, just the JavaScript instance. And the DOM element is only created when we actually add this widget to the document. And all this uh, decorator, you see that it has a unified API to set styles. Um, like if I had this opacity here, it would be normalized and for IE, the filter 
style would be set and for all other browsers the opacity style would be set. The same for the decorator and all, all changes to these elements are not applied immediately to the DOM but they are queued and then in, in an asynchronous flush all of these changes are pushed to the DOM in one, in one batch which reduces the number of, of relay outs the browser has to do. Um, and additionally, the values I've set there, when I read these values, they are cached and the, it doesn't hit the DOM, it actually returns the cached values. So the DOM wrapper is a mixed bag. So it does provide a cross-browser API. It can increase performance in many ways. Um, as I said, inserting nodes can be, can be critical and we can, since we know all the DOM operations which are going to happen, we can order the DOM operations in a way that uh, avoid these pitfalls and it keeps the widget code clean and uh, working with a DOM is very, very streamlined uh, at widget level. Well, obviously the uh, drawback is that it does cause uh, more memory and the complexity of doing this um, is, is of course higher. Um, basically what we are doing is we're trading memory to runtime performance. We do use more memory um, and get a little bit more runtime performance. Okay. So I said before that um, layouts or that we use um, fixed sizes for the images um, and absolute positioning but the sizes must come from somewhere and that in our case that's uh, that are layout managers. So and the layout manager has basically two, uh, two tasks to do. The first is to render the initial layout to give all the widgets the initial position and sizes and uh, for the spinner um, um, measuring where the uh, buttons should be and uh, where the tech input field should be placed like this and the other task is what to do when something resizes, when the browser window resizes or when um, I set a width value and the child nodes have to be resized. So th that are the two tasks for, for, for the layout manager. So basically it has to compute widget sizes based on the available space, um, layout constraints like it has to be in this cell and this column and this row, preferred widget sizes like the label has a preferred widget size which is the size of the label and widget size constraints that is a widget could have a configured minimum size or configured maximum size. So all of this has to t be taken into account to compute the sizes. Basically this is what the browser does as well. And the algorithm that does this is basically a two pass algorithm. We to compute, we first com compute the preferred size. The preferred size of the um, spinner basically is the preferred size of all of its children and then combined with the uh, information the layout manager, in this case the grid, provides. And once we know the size of the, of the root widget and the available space, we can then render every widget from top to bottom um, given the, the known size that we have. So that's the second part, pass. The following slides will be a little bit uh, complicated, N not complicated, I will show a little bit of code. So let me know if you have any questions there. <laughs> okay. So first pass I said I want to compute, uh, compute the, the preferred size of the spinner. And simply what I'm doing is I ask the layout manager. The spinner has a layout manager, I ask the layout manager what is the preferred size of all of my children given this layout. And the late major okay, says, okay, um, give me all the preferred sizes of the children and then I apply my complex or simple layout algorithm 
and compute the preferred size of the aggregate. And the preferred size of the children, again, the text field has the preferred height is the text height. We can measure the height of the, of the text. And I just have a fixed, fixed width because there's no intrinsic preferred width of, an, of an, uh, text field. And for the button, it's even easier. It's just the image size. So, once we know the preferred size of the spinner, we can then go top down from the spinner to all of its children and say, okay, I have the available space um, and, tells, I, uh, and update the DOM elements required for this widget. So it will update the content element, the decorator element, the container element, and then tell the layout manager to do the same for all the children. And the layout manager does its size computation magic, uh, iterates over all the children, and then tells, calls the, re the render layout on all of the children, and the children again just update their DOM positions and DOM sizes. Well, that's not too easy. So we do all the reflow computation in JavaScript. Um, the great benefit is that we can do anything. We have a large collection of layout managers, not just grid layouts, also box layout and flow layouts and other stuff. Um, but it has to be highly optimized. Uh, since we're doing this in JavaScript and there are some browsers which are not so fast in JavaScript, we have to optimize this a lot. So this is not so easy to do. But if a feature is missing, we can implement it. We don't have to wait for any browser vendor to impl implement a feature for us, we can basically implement any layouting behavior we want to have. That's a big win for us. So, layouting summary. Uh, this layouting mechanism is cross-browser. So, it's all JavaScript and it's, the layout managers itself have no references to any low-level code or widget code or whatsoever. We can do custom layout managers, we can do set anything, we can customize it, we can have default sizes for all of our widgets, but of course the drawback is this is not native CSS layouting. And uh, you feel the difference. You feel the difference because if I resize, I can show it. <laughs> so let's. Let's just say I edit, I add this one in a different way. I say edge 20. That's, wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so the resizing of the text field uh, doesn't, doesn't work very well. But uh, it just says, um, 20 pixels from the border. And when I resize this one, you will notice a little lag. And that's because the JavaScript engine has to update the, um, the positions. Um, in Safari and uh, Chrome, actually, you don't really notice this anymore. But, of course, that's uh, the drawback of this approach. And the implementation is not so trivial. Um, Actually, I think GWT 2.0 has implemented a layout engine purely with CSS uh, layouts, but the problem with it, and it's very snappy if you resize, but the problem is adding features to this one is really rocket science. That's <laughs> nothing you want to do. So now to the last topic, events. Like, what can be so hard with events? Let's just click and mouse down and mouse up and key press. But actually, DOM events are stinking. It's not JavaScript is a mess and not the DOM is a mess, but DOM events are even worse. So, <laughs> so 
First of all, there are different APIs. IE has a complete different set of APIs than at any other browser. That's fine. If the behavior is similar, we can add a wrapper on this standard stuff. But it's not nice. It's getting worse. Features. There are some features which are only in IE. There are some features which are not in IE. Basically, it's always IE and not IE. Um, one feature which is not in IE is um, the event capturing phase. Um, the normal behavior for an event is to bubble from the target to the document body. That's a bubbling phase. But the W3C events um, also define a capturing phase where the event starts at the root, bubbles to the target, and then bubbles back to the root. That's a capturing phase. That's not an IE. IE has, on the other hand, mouse capturing, completely unrelated, just a similar name. And mouse capturing is, if you turn on mouse capturing on an element, all mouse events will be dispatched on this element, regardless where the mouse cursor is at the given moment. So it's very useful to do things like drag and drop, where the mouse cursor can leave the dragged element, and the, the mouse event will still be dispatched on the element and not on the unrelated element below the mouse cursor. So both, both features are nice to have, but it's very hard to, to get this cross-browser. And then even worse, they have different behavior. They have different mouse event sequences, like double-click event sequence in IE is different to double-click event sequence in Firefox, where it is mouse down, mouse up, click, mouse down, mouse up, click, double click, and I think IE doesn't fire two of those. Don't remember exactly which one. But that can, can be a problem if you depend on uh, things like this. And key code, char code, are very, very nasty. They depend on the browser, on the operating system, and even on the locale the, the user has set. So that's not nice. <laughs> So our goal would be for this little spinner widget to just specify button up widget, add listener, click, and then a function. And this will handle all of this in the background for us. So the naive implementation is just to add the listeners to the elements, and then you have all these issues I just said. Then that's not. So now we'll tell a little bit how our event uh, implementation works. First of all, we don't attach event handlers directly to the elements. We have a generic mouse event handler. And what this mouse event handler does, it listens on the document body. And all mouse events bubble up to the body and finally will arrive at the mouse event handler. Then we have an event registration. The event registration keeps a mapping of all listeners and all elements. So basically, the event registration does the same as a browser. Uh, it remembers all event listeners. And of course, the mouse event handler has a handle on this registration. And then we have code like this. This is very low level code where we uh, call and add listener on the registration. This will store this information about the element where we want to listen, the ev event type we want to have, and the callback function. So, now it's a funny part. <laughs> okay, what happens if I click on this image? Um, obviously, this is the event, the DOM event, and the DOM event will, well, bubble up to the root. As you see, it will, when it passes uh, the element where the listener is, nothing happens because the listener isn't attached directly to this one. Then it drives at the body. And there the mouse event handler will listen for this event and will get this event. And now the, event handler, the mouse event handler can do anything with it. It can wrap it into a custom event object which normalizes all the API calls. It can even fire synthesized 
events to fill up the event sequences and all fancy stuff. And when it has done this, it can just push it to the event registration and tell the event registration, here's a mouse event. This is uh, the event target, um, for, uh, which can be read from the DOM event. Do whatever you want with it. And at this point, we can handle the dispatch of the event totally um, on our own. So we can now go ahead and say, okay, we want to implement a capturing phase. So we traverse all the DOM elements between the target and the body and dispatch all the handlers first. Or we can do mouse capturing. We can always dispatch this event to the same element. And then finally, the callback function is called. So to solve all these browser issues, um, we simply don't attach event listeners to, to the DOM directly anymore. We, we do this all through generic uh, handlers. There's not only a mouse handler, there's a focus handler, there's a keyboard handler, which does similar things. Yeah, like we have a standard compliance API, we have mouse capturing support, we have uh, the capturing event, uh, capturing phase, and we have a unified behavior where it's possible. Well, like always, we trade this for a little bit loss in performance and uh, increased code size, especially keyboard handling is n not the smallest class in, in our framework because well, this only shows how broken keyboard handling is in the browsers. Okay, let's come to the end, let's sum up. Um, we had this widget. Um, We've seen how this complex widget can be composed out of other simpler widgets. We've seen how simple widgets map to the DOM with the container element, the content element, and the uh, decorator element. Then I've shown a little teaser how theming could look like. Um, why we use the DOM wrapper, how we interact uh, with uh, the DOM, how layouting works, how sizes are computed, and as last thing, events, how we deal with events. And in the beginning I asked you who is framework developer. This is because this is why you want to use a framework. Um, if you want to write a GUI application, this is stuff uh, users shouldn't have to bother with. And that's why they are JavaScript frameworks. So, thank you. So, now it's time to, to take questions. Are there any questions? Yeah, please. Yes. Um, in theory, this shouldn't be a problem. In practice, it still is. Um, if the browser, uh, if the user increases the font size, um, what you could do is uh, pull in the background um, for font size changes, and then trigger a relay out of the uh, um, of the uh, interface. Um, in our case, it's we don't do this polling yet, but what we can do, we can increase the font size and then reload, and then the measurement of the um, labels uh, get the new sizes and the interface will be, will be adopted. Like in this, in this screen, I have incre increased the font size to, um, to make it more readable, and uh, the layout managers will get this, but not yet at runtime. Yes? Okay, let me 
Let me show you the, 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 the HTML. Like this one. If you look closely, there's no styling information in this. This is only positioning. Positioning is things computed by the layout engine and the layout engine has to set it directly on the element. So, um, yes, you could do styling with external classes and with uh, CSS. We have a little different approach to, to styling because um, we want to style widgets uh, on the widget level and not on the DOM element level. So we want to keep the um, abstraction and we have a different approach to, uh, to styling. But in theory, you could, of course, apply styling or CSS classes um, to the widgets. Like you can, all your buttons can have the button class. Then you have some CSS which defines the styles of the buttons. Um, what you cannot do is externalize the size and position information in this approach. Okay, thank you very much.